Did you ever want to punch somebody with a dead fish on the face? Russian game dev got it. Or maybe erase a self-propelled oven fast and furious style. Also got it. Fight the three-headed dragon without either princess or sword? Yes, with a club, but no sword, and the most important, with no princess. Got it, got it, got it. At the dawn of the MS-DOS gaming in Russia in the early 90s, there were really a lot of games made by post-Soviet programmers. Computers were the new religion all over the world, and everyone wanted to grab a piece of that pie. Especially those who already knew how huge the video game market was in the West and hoped to make it there. And yes, theoretically, they could. Alexei Pajitnov could make it even in the 80s, and now, when the Iron Curtain fell, a video game developer from Russia could not only become famous as Alexei did, but even to earn money from the games he or she made. I hope you know the story of Tetris and how the creator of the most important Russian game didn't get a penny for it for a long time. Success of Tetris gave birth to a lot of MS-DOS puzzle games. Some of them were just clones of other popular games, others were quite original ones. Several even became iconic here in Russia, and maybe someday we will dive into them too. But aside from the puzzles, there also were some real deal games. The ones that were made by the Russian gamers from the 90s for the Russian gamers from the 90s. Does anyone smell some interplay here? Not that we needed all that for our PCs, but once you get locked into a serious game development, the tendency is to push it as far as you can. And we had some real deal shit here. The only thing that really worries me is can you withstand some real deal Russian game dev? I'm asking because there is nothing in the world more helpless and irresponsible and depraved than a man in love with bizarre early Russian game dev. But if you're gonna stay here with me for the next 15 minutes, I know you'd get into that rotten stuff pretty soon. Hello YouTube, my name is Victor, and you're watching the Russian Video Game Comrade Show. Eventually, some of the Russian game developers made their way into international companies and made some great games. No, I don't consider CDI Zeldas any good, but did you know that a huge part of both The Faces of Evil and The Wand of Gamillion was made by the Russian division of Animation Magic? The same guys also made animations in the unreleased Warcraft point-and-click game later, and a lot of animations for Sierra's King's Quest 7. And some of the animators from Animation Magic even ended up taking part in the development of such games as Metro Exodus, Quake Champions and Halo Master Chief Collection. In 2023, a lot of us are waiting for release of another Russian game, Atomic Heart. So I think I can tell that some of the Russian games are quite popular all over the world, one way or another. But yes, the main part of the Russian games, especially a lot of early ones, are still region-locked local story known only by Russians who play them on a PC here in Russia in the 90s. I quoted Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas on purpose today. If you'll take a look at some of the first Russian PC games made in the 90s, you'll definitely think they had two bags of grass, 75 pellets of mescaline, and etc. Who in the world could, for example, think of a game where your computer fires missiles into the other Windows icons? Okay, of reskinning the classic game into it and calling it Floppy Killer. Next. Okay, what if, like, you have a guitar, but it's not, like, a real guitar, and you sound like Hendrix and Bowie? Could someone please take McCory's blow away? I think he's losing it. You're a truck driver and you try to kill frogs across the road. No, you are the frog. <laughs> Guys from Nikita Company did, and even then ended up making a great game, Parkan the Imperial Chronicles. Man, I really have to stop talking about shitty games and start talking about good ones. Anyway, a lot of Russian PC games of the 90s are high as hell. How do you, for example, like a first-person fighting, where your and your opponent's health bars are represented by T's left in the mouse? This is Choose an Enemy for MS-DOS from 1991. Who needs Mortal Kombat when you can fight Ivan Zubrovka with 500 sale of Gorbachev vodka permanently staying in his stomach? And yes, this is a real fight to save a woman, not some imaginary outer world will conquer the universe shit. Your Shao Kahn can't stand a chance against Ivan Zubrovka, just like no Wolfenstein or Doom can stand a chance against Dungeons of Kremlin. But that is a story for another episode. And the game I started this video with 
is also a great example for today. Its name is The Crow, and it has nothing to do with the City of Angels, unless we also had our own LA in ancient Russia. In 1992, ONP Software, a game development company with no info on the internet about it, released one of the first, maybe even the very first video game based on the Russian folk tales. And I really think that Ivan the Fool and the Seek of the Treasure is really a game worth of mention, in spite of, or should I even say because of, how it's junked up. Who wouldn't like a game where you can beat a Pushkin's Magic Cat in a Thimble Rig game? race a self-propelled oven like in an ancient Need for Speed game, and play a life and death leapfrog game with swamp monsters. Well, in Russia, no one. And we all grew up on fairy tales about all these things. And the most interesting thing here, the gameplay is also really good and varied for the Russian game from the 90s. The Crow was the only game made by the ONP software, and maybe this is the reason there is no info on the game developer on the internet himself. But there are Russian game enthusiasts from our Old Games Forum, who reverse engineer old games, and they found some interesting stuff inside the crow, leading to its developer. User under the Nick Tigoro liked the soundtrack of the game a lot and decided to extract it from the crow. During the exploration of the game's code, he found that the resources in the game were packed the same way Russian company Nikita did. So basically, there is a big chance that ONP stands for something like other Nikita projects, and this game was made by the same people who made Floppy Killer, Toppler and Parkan the Imperial Chronicles. But we'll probably never know why The Crow wasn't released under the Nikita brand. I'm not really sure if all the stuff above was interesting for someone who didn't play the game as a kid. But maybe it will be, if you know the game better. You really don't have to know a bit of Russian to play The Crow, but the developer decided to also make an English version of the game two years later in 1994. The only difference between The Crow and The Crow version 2 is the title screen, but I really want to know if this version was even attempted to be distributed somewhere outside Russia. Please tell me in the comments section below if you ever heard anything about it. And also, the second version has a soundtrack in it that was missing in the 1992 first version. Originally, there was only a Kalinka Malinka on the title screen. If you want, you can even choose a level to start with on the title screen, but to experience the full game and see the ending credits, you have to finish all of them from the very first one. So let's help Ivan the Fool to get that treasure, and maybe he will even eventually become the game developer, when he gets the money for his online IT training. The game starts with the capitalist version of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin's Learned Cat. If you don't know who is it, but are interested in it, check the video that is linked on the screen now. There is an animated cartoon in English explaining both Pushkin and his character. In the 90s Russia, communist values were quickly replaced by a market economy. And many works of that time are ironic about this. Here in the game, even the 19th century fairy tale cat is earning money by playing a thimbleric game with the players. After defeating the deceiver, we have to participate in another ancient Russian fun. Fist fight. Well, to be honest, only you will be in a fist fight, as your competitor will fight you with a dead fish and a bucket. Because why not? It's almost like Street Fighter 2, but without character selection and one year later. So no, Russians didn't invent fighting games. But they evolved them to a completely new level. You can move your character with left and right buttons, punch or kick with the same buttons if you're holding down space on the keyboard, or dodge the attacks with the button up. Unfortunately, there are no fatalities here, but it still can be really fun for a moment, especially with the animations when you get hit with your rival's weapons. The only problem here is a slight control delay. But once you get used to it, defeating the first enemy will become an easy task, and on the second or third try you'll be even able to do it without losing significant apples. Apples here are your health bar, and believe me, you'll need it later in the game. Unfortunately, there are no cutscenes here, and immediately after defeating Yemelia, yes, that was another Russian fairy tale character, Yemelia. He found a wish fulfilling fish and made it to make his oven a self propelled transport. We take away his Tesla oven and continue our treasure seeking quest. You could tell that the next stage is a burnout game prototype from the 90s Russia. 
we have to raise the Tesla Owen, bypassing the road stones in pursuit of another Russian fairy tale character, Baba Yaga, in her Tesla truck, the house on the chicken legs. I'm telling you, the guys who made up all these fairy tales were definitely completely high. And I also really want to know the reason our character is beating up all these fairy tale characters. Okay, Baba Yaga most of the times is an anti hero in the fairy tales, but Yemela, for example, isn't. And the most important question is, how fighting all these characters is supposed to help our guy to find some treasure? The game isn't telling. Just go Vanya, go. Ok, maybe we'll understand it later. The controls in the racing stage are much better than in the fighting one, and you'll get used to it even faster. Also, the good thing, I suppose, is the fact our self-propelled Owen is a vampire and not only damages the Baba Yaga's house on the chicken legs hitting it, but it also heals itself by doing it. Is it the Bram Stoker's influence I smell here? The only thing you have to keep in mind here, don't try to finish first, unless you want to lose. This is not a racing game. This is Sparta! Sorry for that. And after defeating the vehicle, you also have to defeat its owner in another fighting sequence, very similar to the previous one. I hope no old ladies, even the evil ones, were harmed during the production of the game. Baba Yaga fights with a broomstick and this time will also have a weapon. If you're wondering what kind of treating does our character have, it's a grip. Grip is a device our ancestors used for, wait for it, cooking. With the thing they placed pots, old Russian pans, into the wood stoves and took them out when the cooking was done. We don't actually need to cook Baba Yaga today, so we just hit or undercut her with the grip and block her broomstick attacks if needed. A little practice and you can move on to the next stage. But be sure to save as much health here as you can, because the next stage will be the most challenging in the game. The continues are infinite, but you will always start with the same amount of health you've got when you first entered the level. If you're a From Software's game fan as I am myself, you can even like this level. But most likely, it will set US on fire, as any of the swamp levels in Dark Souls. Yes, your character won't get poisoned here as in Dark Souls swamps, but the time you have to complete this level is limited, so you'll have to act fast as if it was Dark Souls and you were poisoned. The gameplay here seems like an HD remake of a famous Russian computer game Perestroika, also known as Toppler. You have to jump from one bump to another, avoiding swamp monsters or sometimes even using their heads as another bump to get to the far end of the swamp. The gaps between the bumps are different and you have to figure how long you have to keep the jump button pressed to jump for a specific distance. In some moments you also have to time your jump to land on the swamp monster's head while it's up. And this goddamn swamp… What do you have against swamps? I've lived here my whole life and I heartily recommend it. I'm sorry, Johnny. This swamp is really huge. And of course, any mistake during any jump leads you to sinking. Out of health, start all the thing over. The best way to get this past is to memorize all the types of gaps and the time you have to hold the jump button for each of them. Jump, sink, memorize. Try again and eventually you'll get to the final battle. There is no cutscene here either, so again you have to use your imagination to find out how your character got out of the swamps and got to the den of the true evil. Or something like that, as I really find the final three-headed dragon boss cute. On the other hand, he doesn't find you cute and try to instantly kill you with his fire breath and sharp teeth. Block his attacks with a shield and counter them with a club. You have to turn all of his three heads to the stone and that's it. It's not really a hard battle. You just have to mention the dragon's red eye before his attack and act wisely. The time I captured gameplay for this video, I've got to this level with only two hit points left and still I managed to win easily. Congratulations, the treasure is yours. The game still holds up nicely, especially if you're into retro games. It has nice visuals, adaptive gameplay and a lot of fun. 
the lack of some story and connection between the levels is a bummer. But after all, this game was made 30 years ago, at the dawn of the Russian video game's development, and it's still playable. Yes, basically it's just a pack of several mini-games sewed with Russian fairy tale needles. But once again, for 1992, I think it's just fine. As for Nikita Company, the guys who probably made this game, they continued to make video games and even had some western releases later. I'm sure a lot of MS-DOS video games enthusiasts know the game Highway Hunter from 1994, released by Epic Mega Games. I even have it in a sealed big box in my collection. Yes, you understood it right. Highway Hunter was also developed by Nikita Games. Unfortunately, here in Russia there were almost no official physical releases of our early PC games in the 90s. Even the Russian big boxed games from the early 2000s are not an easy fetch. And I never saw even a photo of an original The Crow floppy disk. And there had to be at least one. Why? I think you know why, especially if you watched all the RVGC episodes carefully. Poor Russian people of the 90s and total piracy of everything here in Russia. 99% of the games for my 486 PC I've got back then were copied from hard disks of the other PC owners I knew. I saw some stores selling pirated floppies and one time even bought a several floppy Disney's Lion King bootleg release, just the floppies in a plastic bag. But even such distribution was a problem in the early 90s in Russia. The owner of Nikita Company told in the interview for Russian PC Review in the 2000s that they had some official releases of their games back then, but it was really challenging even to produce them in the early 90s in Russia. Floppies were expensive and hard to find, and it was nearly impossible even to find a company that could make packaging for the game. And all of this changed only in the mid-late 90s, when some official Russian video games began to sell in the new computer stores that flooded all the big cities of Russia. Hard Truck, The Rage of Mages, Pirates of the Caribbean, and so on. But this happened much, much later. Thank you for watching today's video. I hope you liked it. Please press thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Have a nice day, good luck,